Good evening, everyone. Thank you for taking your time to be here to, uh, to learn about the mystery of the Eucharist in a very unique way in which Jesus revealed himself to us in uh, a miracle, a miracle that boggles the intellectual mind. And he has provided us that wonderful miracles in order for us to ponder the great mystery of his love. And we're so fortunate to have Dr. Amy Goodier, who is going to give us a presentation. She has been working on this. I've asked her uh, quite a few months ago, um, and she has poured um, much of her time and research into this uh, presentation. And I know um, she has truly prayed uh, with this uh, great uh, gift that the uh, Lord has given to the church. And so all of us, I know, will be um, so enlightened and also our faith strengthened. So please welcome Dr. Amy Goodyear. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming tonight. We're going to get started with a word of prayer in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grant me, O God, a mind to know you, a heart to seek you, wisdom to find you, conduct pleasing to you, faithful perseverance in waiting for you, and a hope of finally embracing you. Amen. St. Thomas Aquinas. Blessed Carlo Acutis. I'm going to just dive right in. Can we go back one? Okay. Sorry. Okay, here we go. So St. Thomas Aquinas once said, to one who has faith, no explanation is necessary. And to one without faith, no explanation is possible. So for some of you here tonight, this lecture is purely going to be entertaining, and that's totally fine. I really do hope you enjoy it. But I do pray that God will open the hearts and the minds of everyone listening. I pray that we all remain open to anything that God may want us to learn or to hear tonight, and of course, always. So we're going to start with the definition of a miracle. What is a miracle? A miracle is any effect perceptible by the senses, produced by God, which surpasses the power of nature. So physical mir miracles are occurrences which are beyond the laws of physical nature. You may have never considered this, but miracles are actually a very important part of our Catholic faith. If you think about it, without Jesus' miracles, his teachings, no matter how profound and enlightening they were, would have made him just another great teacher or an incredible prophet. No one would have believed that he was the Messiah or the Son of God without his signs and wonders. So a belief in miracles really is at the heart of our Catholic faith. Now having said that, these miracles that we're going to talk about tonight, the Catechism does not require a belief in these miracles. The Church has investigated them and they tried to ascertain their authenticity and to rule out fraud and to make sure that the teachings gained from these miracles are in line with the Catholic Church, the dogma um, and magisterial teachings. They've accepted the miracles, but that doesn't mean that you have to believe in them to be a Catholic or to get sanctified or anything like that. So we'll just go through and we'll see how you feel at the end. So my main sources of information for, the, for this lecture are these two books. The first one is called A Cardiologist Examines Jesus, and it's by Dr. Franco Serafini. And it's a great book. I really recommend it. Christmas is coming. It's a great stocking stuffer. Uh, the talk is basically the cliff notes of this book. And I also used Carlo Acutis, the first millennial saint, and this one is also highly recommended. You might be wondering why Carlo Acutis, so let's take a closer look at his life. And of course, my brief introduction to Carlo Acutis is not going to do him justice, but he was born in May of 1991, and he died in October of 2006 at the age of 15 from an aggressive form of leukemia. But he was an amazing kid, and he had an absolutely remarkable understanding of theology. During his early childhood years, he would ask his parents to take him to daily mass, and ultimately, he started going to confession weekly, even at a young age. 
He was the kind of guy that would stand up to bullies. He'd go sit by the kids that were alone. He would tutor kids who were struggling and he would just be friends with everybody. He was just really a great kid, very selfless, knew what charity was and what true selflessness was. One of the things that he's known for is his work on cataloging all of the Eucharistic miracles. Blessed Carlo learned at a very early age that most kids don't want to talk about God or the Eucharist outright. But if you brought up miracles like Lourdes and Fatima and Eucharistic miracles, people perked up and they wanted to listen. So in an effort to evangelize, he started to catalog and document all of these Eucharistic miracles. And his work resulted in a Eucharistic miracle exhibition that actually still tours today. That's pretty amazing. Here's an example of one of the posters that's in the exhibition. It's beautiful, very detailed. There's pictures of the miracles. It probably took an incredible amount of research and time and effort. So I, of course, encourage you to check this out online if you get a chance. So Carlo is going to walk us through this talk. We're going to start with one of his most famous sayings, which is, the Eucharist is my highway to heaven. Carlo meant this very literally. He truly believed in the supernatural nature of the Eucharist. He was able to see the real connection between heaven and earth during the consecration, and he knew that the Eucharist was really literally a piece of heaven. It was heavenly food. It was manna from heaven. When we say the Our Father, we say, give us this day our daily bread. Well, the Latin translation of our daily bread is actually panem nostrum supersubstantialum, which more accurately translates into our supernatural bread, a bread that is above all substance, that surpasses all creatures. And I think that's pretty amazing. So Carlo is absolutely correct that there is something extremely special about the Eucharist. And we're going to come back to Blessed Carlo throughout the lecture for more of his words of wisdom. But let's dive into our Eucharistic miracles. So you, a Eucharistic miracles technically occur at every Mass. Every time the host is consecrated, a Eucharistic miracle occurs because bread and wine is transformed into the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. But what we're talking about tonight are things that happen on top of or in addition to that core Eucharistic miracle. So to date, there are over 100 Eucharistic miracles that have been reported. There's probably in the upper of 150 at this point. They've happened in at least 19 countries, and the oldest one um, dates back to around the first century. So when we talk about Eucharistic miracles, there are very different kinds of Eucharistic miracles. There are miraculous communions. This is when the Eucharist is received by Mary or an angel or Christ himself. There are miraculous fastings. There's a woman by the name of Therese Newman, who was a mystic from the early 1900s, who claimed to have survived on the Eucharist alone for over 30 years. St. Catherine of Siena was also known to go on these prolonged fasts, only surviving on the Eucharist. But what we're going to talk about tonight are miraculous transformations, where the material Eucharist changes in some physical way. So what we're going to discuss are five miracles that have undergone fairly recent scientific research or investigation. We'll get into the details about the miracles and the tests that they use to determine these miraculous, the authenticity of these miracles. We're going to start with the oldest one, and then we're going to work our way to the most recent miracle, and that'll give you a chance to see how technology has changed and improved throughout the investigation of these miracles. So our first stop is in Lanciano, Italy, and this miracle occurred somewhere between the years of 700 and 750 AD. The story of this miracle goes that there was a priest who doubted whether or not Jesus' flesh was truly present in the consecrated host, and I'm sure that makes you feel a little better because he was a priest and he still had doubts. He was a student of science, but he was still very devout, and he was torn because he wanted to believe, but he was having trouble. So he would often pray to God to give him more faith. Well, one day when he was celebrating Mass, while he was saying the words during consecration, he saw the host and the blood change to what he believed were flesh and blood. Now what's neat about this miracle 
is that we still have the relics, even though it happened back in the 700s. They're intact, and they're actually fairly well-preserved. Here you can see, see if it, I don't know if that's gonna work, but the picture on um, my right shows the Eucharist and if you look in the middle, there's a monstrance, and it has the Eucharist in the monstrance, and underneath it, there's a chalice that contains the um, wine that turned to blood. The monstrance is still actually on display today in the Church of St. Francis, which was built in 1258, on the spot that the miracle was believed to have happened. So in 1970, an anatomic pathologist by the name of Ordando Linoli was asked to investigate these relics. His objectives were, first, to see if he could examine the flesh microscopically, if he can get an actual piece and look at it under the microscope, then to determine if the blood substance could actually be proven to be blood, to see if, the, see if he can speciate the flesh and blood, see what species it belonged to, to identify the protein components in the blood, and then also to determine the blood type of both the flesh and the blood specimens. So we're going to look at his findings. So looking at the tissue in the top picture, Linoli described it macroscopically, or what we call grossly, just looking at it, how do you describe it? And he described it as being six centimeters in diameter. The texture was hard, almost wooden. It was thicker around the edges, and it thinned out towards the middle or the central cavity. There were white, dry stains present, but these were easily detached. And there were also some residues of small insects and ma maggots in the um, specimen. So the presence of insects, it makes you, it shows that it, they weren't in the airtight container. These things had been left to the elements for over a thousand years. One of the interesting things that he also noted is that the actual gross appearance of the Eucharist resembles the cross section of a heart. Let's see, I don't know why this isn't working, but if you look at the top picture, there's your relic. Underneath it is a cross-section of a heart from an autopsy. And you can see on the bottom, the, thick, the thickened area with a thickened wall is the left ventricle of the heart. Then there's a septum that separates the left ventricle from the right ventricle on the other side. It has a thinner um, wall. And if you kind of take that and look at the picture on top and kind of get rid of the septum in the middle, I can see what he's talking about. It kind of does look like it's thicker in one area, and then when you go to the other side, it thins out. So it might be a bit of a stretch, but I can see what he's talking about. So luckily for Linoli, he was able to acquire a bit of the tissue from both of the samples. Initially, he had a rough time staining it because it was so old, but eventually he got it to fix to a slide and he got it to stain. And the first thing that he was able to confirm when he looked at it microscopically, that it, was it, it actually was cardiac human tissue, or it was, excuse me, it was cardiac tissue, or muscle from the heart. He couldn't just tell by looking at it that it was human, but it looked like cardiac tissue. He even took it a step further and said that he believed it to be from the left ventricle of the heart, that it contained myocardium, which is the heart tissue, but also a lining on the uh, myocardium, which is called endocardium, and fragments of nerve that he believed was the vagus nerve. Another interesting thing that he said was that the cross section that he took that is in his, um, his sample was like an expert cross section of the heart. So it gave all the layers of the heart um, laid out perfectly, which was odd because people didn't even start studying the heart microscopically until the 1500s. He also noted that there, was a, there were changes of rigor mortis that looked to have occurred after the tissue was fixed on display by nails. So what they did was after the miracle occurred, they stuck it onto a display and they nailed it to kind of stretch it out and show the miracle. Well, after they did that, it appears as though the tissue underwent rigor mortis and shrunk towards those nails, which would imply that when the relic was placed there initially, it was fresh tissue that was still alive. So when I say that it was expertly laid out, it looked like a nice cross section, what I mean is on this bottom picture or image, you can see how there's a, a lining tissue on one side that's your endocardium, 
the myocardium, and then there's what you call the pericardium on the outside. And back then, if they didn't know that there were different layers of the heart, if somebody was just gonna go kind of rob a grave, they would have just taken a chunk of tissue from the heart. They wouldn't have taken ni a nice slice of cardiac tissue, if that makes sense. So if you look at that picture, and you compare it to the picture above it, where it fronds out, it's kind of smooth. That's what he believed was the endocardial lining. And then everything that's on this side of that lining is what he believed to be myocardial tissue. So noting this and looking at the whole picture together, he believed that the actual cross section of the relic truly was a consistent with the cross section of a full heart, if that makes sense. Now I'll tell you that I can see what he's talking about, but I'm with you guys and it's a bit skeptical. I'm a bit skeptical when you look at it, it does look like it's just a black chunk of tissue, correct? I can see what he means though. There's definitely something that looks smoother and looks like a lining. But remember this is again in 1970. So our ability to stain things and to look at things microscopically, it's improved over the, the years. So hopefully with some of our next um, miracles, we'll see a little bit better resolution. But for all intents and purposes, he makes a pretty good case that it's cardiac muscle. So also of note, with the flesh sample and the blood sample as well, and we'll get to it a little bit more in a minute, he was able to type the tissue as AB. So your blood type can be found on your tissues, but also on your blood. And he did find that not only was it AB typed, but it also contained human antigens as well, confirming that this was human um, in origin. So now we're gonna move on to the blood sample that was in the chalice underneath it. This sample consisted of five clots of blood that in aggregate weighed 15.85 grams. Interestingly, during the initial investigation, way back when the miracle occurred, they had the five blood clots and they weighed them. They were clearly different sizes to the naked eye, but when they weighed them individually, they all weighed the same amount. And then when they weighed them in aggregate, they still weighed that same amount. Now they've never been able to reproduce those findings. They've measured them since and they've all been different measurements. And we can argue that maybe there was something wrong with their scale, although I'm sure they've checked it a number of times. But what's interesting is that what this symbolizes, and I, I thought this was something that was worth sharing, is that no matter the size, even the smallest drop of Christ's blood contains the complete and invisible substance of the entire invisible presence of Jesus. So they kept that as they moved forward with this the tail of this miracle that was something that was always kind of um, kept sacred to them. Now, unfortunately, Linoli was not able to make a slide or a, a, a smear out of um, this sample. But what he was able to do was some chemical analysis of the material. So first what he did was he ran a chemistry or a, an electrolyte panel. This is the routine blood work that you probably all have had from your doctors. It is, um, a test that shows the level of things like sodium and potassium and glucose in your blood. And what he found was that all of those electrolytes that we measure in human blood all the time were actually present in this sample. Now the concentrations were low and he figured that that was due to the dehydrated um, nature of the specimen and the fact that it was so old. But it was very interesting to find that all of these electrolytes are actually present in this material. But probably the most impressive thing that he found was a test that it, it's something called protein electrophoresis that he was able to perform on this tissue. So this test helps you separate out and quantitate specific proteins that are found in human blood. And what Linoli wanted to see was whether the, these proteins were actually in the sample. And he found that not only were all the proteins in the sample, but they matched perfectly that of healthy human blood. So here's a diagram or a, a chart, a graph chart from our, um, our miracle. And you can see it says blood of Lanciano. And it has all of the values for the proteins that were in the blood. And right to the um, left of it or to your right of it, they have the normal ranges for what's considered normal in these studies. So as you can see, albumin is within normal ranges. All the rest of them are within normal ranges. 
And a normal albumin, as a side note, even as insinuates that he was actually healthy, who, whoever this blood is from was actually healthy and well-nourished at the time that this sample was taken. And then to the side of this, you see there's a graph. You can actually, this is, it's kind of an old graph. They look a little bit different nowadays. But at the time, you could take a healthy, normal human's um, blood protein electrophoresis and superimpose it on this graph, and it would be absolutely identical. It would match up perfectly. So I thought that was pretty interesting. So as I mentioned earlier, Linoli was able to detect human antigens on both the tissue and the blood sample, and he was also able to prove that it had an AB blood type. So let's look at how we, he figured that out. So first, to speciate the material, Linoli performs something that's called a Ulinith antigen antibody test. Now we don't, use, we don't really use these too much anymore, but it's based on the fact that every species has a distinct protein antigen on all of its cells that's specific to that specific species. So humans have a human antigen, cats have a, a cat antigen on all of their cells, dogs have a dog antigen on all of their cells. So what Linoli basically did was he took um, samples of the tissues and mixed them with antibodies to all these different antigens. And the only one that actually reacted was the human antigen to antibody which proved that it must have had the human antigen on it, which insinuates that it is of human origin. Now, ABO blood type is determined in a similar manner. If y'all remember from science class, you can be A, AB, B, or O type blood. So there can be A antigens and or B antigens in all your cells. These antigens are on both blood and tissue. If you have the A antigen, you're type A. If you have a B antigen, you're type B. If you have A and B, you're AB. And if you have a, no, no antigens at all, you're type O. So we can figure out the blood type by mixing antibodies to these specific antigens, um, or the um, anti antibodies to the specific antigens that are on the blood cells. So in the case of the miraculous tissue, there was a reaction to both A and B antibodies, classifying this tissue as AB. And it turns out that AB blood group is actually the rarest blood group. So the fact that both samples were AB typed is pretty significant because it makes it more likely that they came from the same source. It's, very, it's not very common for us to find AB blood. So regardless if it came from the tissue or from a contamination, whatever it was, they came from the same source, most likely. So let's kind of summarize this miracle with some potential issues and fun findings. What are some of the potential issues? Well, first, there's no real historical documentation about this relic. Remember, this happened somewhere between 700 and 750, but the earliest written account that we have of it was on a stone tablet from the 1600s. Secondly, there's a huge lack of chain of custody, so no one really knows who's been allowed to tamper with these relics throughout the years. And finally, Linoli was the only one who really carried out any of this experimentation, which doesn't make for great scientific evaluation. It's always better to have multiple people involved, to repeat testing, and to have lots of documentation, but he was pretty solo on this investigation. Now, on the other hand, there were definitely some interesting things that are worth noting. First, even though there's no sign of embalming on this tissue, the organic material still managed to remain preserved for over a thousand years, even to the point of retaining its biological nature. Remember, they had proteins, they had sodium. There were biological components in this material. So how could it survive this long without deteriorating? especially since it was left open to the elements. Remember, there were maggots in the tissue, so it was you know, left open and exposed to air. Now, some of y'all may bring up that it was hard as a rock, so maybe it was petrified. Well, usually in petrification, the organic material is completely replaced by minerals. So the substance actually kind of becomes a mineral replica of itself. It doesn't really retain its original components. And here, again, we see that sodium, potassium, glucose were all present, and the protein electrophoresis was compatible with normal human blood. None of those components would have stayed if, it, if this material would have been completely replaced by minerals. 
in bringing that up again, protein electrophoresis also, how do we explain away that the protein profile was the same as that of normal human blood? And again, both of the tissues had human antigens on them, and they were able to be typed as, AB, um, as an AB blood group. So something interesting is happening here, and I think it's definitely something that we can't really explain. Now, I know this is a little off topic, but it's one of my favorite saint quotes. It's, everyone is born original, but most end up dying photocopies. This is an incredible quote coming from a high school student who was surrounded every day by people who were more worried about fitting in on earth and blending in with the crowd and less worried about fitting in with God's plan. We're supposed to be what God wants us to be, and blessed Carlo Acutis got that. He knew that we're not supposed to be what the world wants to turn us into. So I think he'd agree in saying, in a world of princesses, dare to be Batman. Don't be scared to stick out. As long as you're doing God's will, you're better off. It's like St. Teresa of Calcutta said, it was never between you and them anyway. It was only ever between you and God. So now we're gonna head to Argentina, to Buenos Aires. The inhabitants of this small parish were fortunate enough to experience five Eucharistic miracles between the years 1992 and 1996, all of which occurred in the same Buenos Aires parish. So we're gonna take a look at each one. On May 1st, 1992, a lay Eucharistic minister found a couple of crescent-shaped host fragments lying on a corporal, which is the square cloth used to handle sacred vessels, outside of a tabernacle, the tabernacle. He reported his findings to a priest and when it is instructed to initiate the dissolving process per church protocol. When the host is dropped and deemed too dirty to consume, the usual protocol is that they place it in water until it dissolves. And the idea behind this is that once the visible host is gone, so is the divine presence. So that's usually the protocol when a host is considered unconsumable. Um, so the Eucharistic minister placed the host fragments in a container of water and locked it inside the tabernacle. A week later, on May 8th, he returned to find what appeared to be three blood clots floating in the water. The clots were initially covered with a white fuzz that later disappeared. There were also blood streaks on the wall of the container as if it had been produced by some sort of explosion of the tissue fragments that had happened when the, when the um, container was closed. On the following Sunday, May 10th, at both the 7 and 8.15 Masses, a new miraculous event occurred, actually twice. The paten, which is the metal plate that the priest uses to hold the consecrated host on during Mass, was stained with blood. Now this happened once at the 7 o'clock and then again at the 8.15 Mass, and it was on two different patents. One was a plain bronze um, patent, and the other one was a tiny fish-shaped patent. Unfortunately, they don't have pictures of that one. But if you look at this picture, you can see the initial 1992 um, miracle. And you can see that it looks for all intents and, purpose, intents and purposes like blood. Now we're going to move to the 1994. A couple of years later, at a children's mass on Ju July 24th, a lay minister of communion was taking a pix from the tabernacle when he noticed a running drop of blood on the inner rim of the ciborium. I couldn't find an image of this. They didn't take pictures of it. It was sort of known as a minor event that was overshadowed by the 1992 and the 1996 events, but I'm sure the people who witnessed it didn't think it's minor. Um, but just for um, visual aid, we'll go over some of the um, things that we're going to talk about in this talk. On the far, um, on your far right, the hand is holding a pix. It's um, what we use to take usually um, Eucharistic the hosts to the homebound. And then on this side, we have the patent. In the middle, we have a ciborium. And then on the bottom, we have um, the corporal or the um, linen cloth. So again, this one, it's been documented, but they didn't have any images of it. So we're gonna fast forward to August 18th, 1996. 
Following the 7 p.m. mass, one of the faithful noticed an abandoned post hidden in the base of a candlestick in front of a crucifix, presumably left there by someone with desecrating intent. She immediately let the celebrant know, and once again, the host was too dirty to consume, so the priest instructed her to initiate the dissolving process. The host was immersed in water and locked in the tabernacle. About a week later, on August 26, the Eucharistic minister noticed something strange in the round glass container, and she alerted the priest, who called one of the aux auxiliary bishops, who recommended taking professional photographs of the event. And you can see those photographs on your left side. You can see it's a clear container, and it looks cloudy with this red substance in it. At this point, little remained of the dissolving host, the water had become more turbid with a red cloud-like substance and darker jelly-like clumping that resembled clotted blood. Darker mold-like blooms were seen on the surface of the presumed blood clot. After about a month, the remnants were transferred to a closed bottle of distilled water where they remained until the material was investigated three years later. And just for the record, Distilled water is not what you want to put something like that in. That is not a good medium or preservative for any kind of tissue. So a couple of years later, in 1998, a new Archbishop of Buenos Aires decided to allow the scientific investigation of these relics. He called in a man by the name of Ricardo Castanian Gomez. Dr. Castanian was known as a supernatural event researcher. He had a PhD in psychology and was known to be an expert in psychosomatics, biochemistry, and neuropsychophysiology. So interestingly, he had developed this interest in this mystical phenomenon, specifically when it came to medical issues or from a medical standpoint. And he started this kind of research in about, at around 1992. And he was investigating this phenomena initially with great skepticism, but after a few years of investigating them, he became a Catholic convert. So Dr. Castanian had a small group of people at his disposal, it was like his little task force, that would help him with these investigations. They were fairly well known and no stranger to the media, but thankfully they knew the importance of chain of custody, they knew the importance of being blinded, having blinded observations, and of continued documentation. So they really wanted to do the right thing and they really wanted to do correct research on these um, relics or these miracles. His investigation included material from the 1992 and 1996 events. Remember, the 1994 event didn't really yield much to study. And the investigations commenced on October, in October of 1999. So the first thing he did was a chemical analysis of both of the miracles. So for the 1992 miracle, a tiny sample of dried blood was collected. They did an orthotoluidine test for hemoglobin detection, which was negative. DNA analysis was performed and human DNA was actually identified. An attempt was made to, for further DNA, I'm sorry, an attempt was made for further DNA profiling. So profiling in the sense that they wanted to be able to compare DNA from the sample to anyone who had been in contact with the sample to rule out contamination or hoax. They weren't really trying to sequence the whole DNA. But that further profiling was unsuccessful due to an inability to identify something known as standard short tandem repeat sequences. We'll talk a little bit more about DNA and get into the specifics of that at the end, but it's just important to know that they were not able to profile any further. In this situation, they did not, they chose not to do blood typing. They said that they wanted to keep the um, quantity of sample to be able to run things like DNA profiling instead, that was more important to them, so they didn't do blood group analysis. And this was as far as they could get with the 1992 sample. Now the 1996 sample consisted of a brown semi-solid material preserved in distilled water, and again, I use that term preserved loosely because that's not the proper preser preservative or fixative for any kind of tissue. Once again, they tried to do an orthotoluidine test, and it was negative, so it failed to detect hemoglobin. DNA analysis was performed, and a small concentration of good quality, high molecular weight human DNA was actually isolated, but once again, they were not able to further profile it. 
And again, on this one, they didn't do ABO blood grouping. So luckily, with the 1996 specimen, they were able to also not only chemically analyze it, but they were also able to do um, a microscopic analysis. Samples were sent to a man by the name of Dr. Robert Lawrence, who was at the time the medical examiner in San Francisco. Glass slides were made for microscopic evaluation, and Dr. Lawrence's evaluation stated that, number one, he could identify white blood cells. He said that given the microscopic appearance, these white cells had to have been active and living at the time the sample was taken. He also commented that he was baffled as to how the cells actually survived as long as they did in distilled water, noting that given the osmotic gradient between the water and the cells, water should have rushed into the cells and caused them to burst within 15 minutes of them being put in there. He had no idea how this survived for three years in distilled water. Additionally, he saw some clusters of these pink cells that he believed were keratinized squamous cells. These are your skin cells, and they have that keratin layer on top of them as a protective layer. And he said that these cells had white cells infiltrating into them. Intrigued by his findings, Dr. Lawrence set the sent the sample to a prominent medical examiner in New York by the name of Dr. Frederick Zagib to get his take on the tissue. Zagib was given the material blindly. He was very enthusiastic and demanded that he knew where the tissue came from, but they did not let him know where it came from. Now, Dr. Zagib is recorded as saying that the tissue was heart muscle from the left ventricle near the valve area. Now, cardiac muscle has some unique characteristics that help you differentiate it from other types of muscle, like skeletal muscle and smooth muscle. Unlike smooth muscle, there are these things called striations or lines that you can see in the cytoplasm microscopically. They also have a very unique way of branching and they have these unique cell connections called intercalated discs. So there are visible ways that you could see the difference between the different types of muscle. Zigi commented that this cardiac muscle was indeed inflamed. It had, lots of, it had lost its striations and had been infiltrated once again by white cells. To him, the presence of such preserved white cells meant that the heart tissue was still alive at the time the sample was taken. And remember, when when we get tissue for autopsy, even though the deceased has passed, their tissue still lives for a while until it runs out of oxygen. So most of the time, when you get samples from an autopsy, the tissue's still alive when you get it. And this was kind of the impression that he was under, that it was taken from fresh tissue. He hypothesized further that the heart belonged to someone who had been wounded or suffered trauma, saying that there were areas of cardiac muscle death like you see in a heart attack. He said it resembled what he often saw in autopsies from patients who had been in motor vehicle accidents with chest trauma from a steering wheel, people who had undergone excessive resuscitation maneuvers, or people who had received severe blows to the chest. So it looked like the heart had been damaged. When he found out that it was a consecrated host, he was absolutely shocked. So now, issues with this miracle. Once again, chain of custody. With all these events, you're really relying on first-hand witnesses, and most of them weren't recorded at the time of the miracle. They were also, they didn't perform the investigations until years later. And enough DNA was never connected, was never collected to be able to rule out that it was a hoax, that the, the blood wasn't um, placed there externally by someone else. Also, there's the issue that Dr. Lawrence, again, first favored that the specimen was indeed skin. But he admits later that the lack of striations kind of threw him off. Since the experiment, he's, he's discussed with Dr. Zagib and also some other pathologists, and their consensus was that it was most consistent with cardiac muscle. Now, on the other hand, once again, you have tissue here that was preserved regardless of the very poor fixation. Again, how did these white cells live in distilled water for three years? 
we also have it proven in this case that there was the presence of human DNA. And also, once again, if these investigations weren't done until three years later, how do we explain that the tissue appeared alive when they looked at it during the investigation? I think that many people do not fully understand the Mass because if they recognize the enormous blessings that we have in the Lord, who gives himself as our food and drink in the sacred host, they would go to Mass every day to participate in the fruits of the sacrifice and let go of many, so many superfluous things. Again, Blessed Carlo Acutis was a teenager, yet he had his life prioritized, centered, and ordered better than probably anyone in this room. We're all guilty of distraction by superfluous and meaningless things in this world. And we need to pray for each other that we can all get out of the stronghold and focus on what's really important. So now we're going to move to Tixla, Mexico. Our Tixla case begins in October of 2006, which coincidentally, Blessed Carlo Acutis died on October 12th, 2006. Here, a pastor of a parish of St. Martin Tours invited a guest priest, Father Reito, to lead a spiritual retreat for his parishioners. During a mass on October 21st, 2006, where there were, I think they said, over 600 participants, it was a huge retreat, a nun who was helping distribute communion noticed that one of the hosts began to effuse a red substance. She immediately brought the host to Father Reito, who professed it to be a miracle. There's Father Reito holding the host. In 2009, our friend from Buenos Aires, Dr. Castanian, was invited to investigate the relic by the bishop with a specific ob objective to determine if the blood-like substance had been added to the host from the outside or if it actually had originated from the inside of the host. Dr. Castagna was able to obtain a three millimeter sized fragment of apparent blood stained host for investigation. Before we review his findings, you should know, again, we're getting a little bit farther along in our um, scientific uh, and technology and our practices. These results were verified multiple times and by multiple methods. Also, some of the scientists performing these studies did so under blind conditions. That is, they had no idea what the source of the blood was from. So our methods are improving. So this go round, the presence of human hemoglobin was actually confirmed. Remember, hemoglobin is an iron binding protein that helps carry oxygen through the blood to the tissues. And it's exclusively found in red blood cells and isn't seen in any other cell. They used a test called the capillary immunochromatography test which is specific not only for hemoglobin, but it's specific for human hemoglobin. It's sort of like a urinary pregnancy test where they have antibodies that react specifically to human hemoglobin. And if there's a reaction, if the antibody connects to the antigen, it lights up and there's a visible sign. So they were able to make that connection that it was actually human hemoglobin. They were also able to make a blood smear that yielded visible red cells and white cells that showed enough detail to be subclassified as neutrophils, monocytes, and basophils. They even did an antibody study to confirm that they were in fact white cells. There's a reaction with an antibody to a substrate called myeloperoxidase that they use. Myeloperoxidase is only seen in white cells and there was a reaction confirming the presence of myeloperoxidase. This one they actually typed and it was once again, blood type AB. Next, they got an imaging expert to use a high powered ultra bright light and ultraviolet light emitting digital microscope to study the tissue. The microscope scanned the specimen and showed that fresh blood was still present in the more darkly stained portion of the host beneath a superficial layer of clotted blood. This was interesting and impressive because the miracle had taken place three years prior to the actual study. So what it looked like was that the host was actually still bleeding actively underneath the clotted blood on top. Mm. 
Now, two separate studies were used to analyze the distribution and penetration pattern of blood on the host. The penetration pattern was studied by creating a cross-section image using macroscopic and microscopic features of the host, and by also using an infrared light technique. So they shined light in it, they tried to get an idea of what an actual cross-section of the host looked like. Both methods agreed that the cross-section looked like an inverted cone. So if you see the picture towards me, they give the cross-section, it looks like the surface is the line and then it tapers into a point. So the point fans out and goes to the surface. It looks like an inverted cone. If you think about it, if the blood was applied to the outside of the host, you'd see a penetration pattern. If you look at the second picture, it would be most like the first column that you see in that second picture. It would penetrate evenly throughout the host, if that makes sense. You, it would just trickle down, correct? But instead, what you get is instead of it trickling down, it kind of funnels to this one point. And that isn't really phys physiologically possible. That doesn't make much sense. What makes more sense is that in this situation, it actually started from the pinpoint and spreads out to cover the top of the host. So in their investigation, what they concluded is that both me methods seem to rule out the possibility that blood could have been applied to the external surface of the host, but instead the cross-sectional findings supported that the blood originated from, originated from a small focus within the host and spread to cover the outside of the host. So it looked like, in their words, a pinprick that just started to flood and spread. Now when it came to microscopic evaluation of the tissue, they once again saw these cellular fibers that they describe as looking in all likelihood like cardiac muscle. There are abundant bundles of elongated fibers that were well stained um, on H&E stain. Once again, they had striations, the, the striations and intercalated discs were once again absent, but it did still resemble cardiac tissue with changes suggestive of suffering. This time they tried to do some immunohistochemical or antibody testing that was specific for muscle tissue. So they tried to get antibodies to things like desmin and myosin, which are specific for, they're only found in the cytoplasm of muscle tissue, hoping to prove that it was muscle tissue, but those tests were negative, and they attributed that negativity to the age of the specimen. So it looks like muscle, but they weren't able to confirm that it actually was muscle. They were also able to identify some adipose or um, fat cells in the specimen. Human, a, human DNA was identified this go-round, but again, no genetic profile could be obtained. Back to Blessed Carlo. Our, most, our ultimate goal must be the infinite and not the finite. If God possesses our hearts, then we will possess the infinite. This is one of the major points of Catholic teaching, that we're not meant for the finite. We were originally created for the infinite. The infinite is our home. So we shouldn't be worried about or distracted by worldly or material or secular things. Instead, we should only be concerned with getting ourselves and those we love back to heaven. Nothing else matters. Now our journey is gonna take us to Poland. We're going to Sokolka, which is up there in the northeast um, corner of the, the country. It's close to Lithuania and Belarus that are on the other side. On Sunday, October 12, 2008, at the 830 Mass in St. Anthony of Pauda Church in Sokolka, one of the priests dropped the host. One of the parishioners was kneeling at the altar rail to receive communion when she noticed that the host was on the first step of the altar. So she quietly alerted the presiding priest who picked up the host. Again, it was too dirty to consume, so they decided instead to place it in a container of water to dissolve. So after mass, the sacristan, Sister Julia Dabowska, poured the contents of the container into a larger vessel and then locked it in the sacristy safe. She was the only one who had access to this safe. A week later, on October 19th, she went to check on the host and found that part of the host had not yet dissolved. 
This fragment was partially covered by a solid red protruding stain resembling a blood clot. It measured about one to one and a half centimeters. The water in the container remained clear. Sister, Sister Dabowska called over the priest, who at the time was astonished, but decided to remain quiet about the event because they wanted to wait until the bishop was informed. The bishop was eventually informed, and he was able to question those involved, verifying the facts, and he instructed the priests then to separate the entire solid portion made up was, of what was left of the host and the mysterious red clot from the water, and then to lay it on a small corporal. The corporal was then, as you can see here, placed in a, monster, um, in a monstrance, and once again placed in the tabernacle. A few months later, on January 7, 2009, an investigation was initiated. The investigation was entrusted to two local anatomic pathologists, Dr. Sokowski and Professor Sobinayak Latowska, both with very impressive resumes. They took a small sample of the specimen, which included the red clot material and some of the undissolved host. Dr. Sobinayak Latowska was there when the samples were taken, but Dr. Sokowski was not. He was kept unaware of the origin of the specimen throughout the investigation. And both investigators actually worked independent of each other. They were able to inspect the specimens using both light microscope and transmission electron microscopes. So a light microscope is what I use every day where I work. It's just a regular microscope that you use to look at tissue morphology. So I can see some details of the cells. I can see the nucleus. Sometimes I can see chromatin or like DNA within the nucleus and some of the organelles, but you can't see it in great detail. But a transmission electron microscope is amazing. You can see so much more detail. You can see the organelles. It's just incredibly helpful in um, identifying unknown tissue because you can kind of see the structures. So let's see what they found. First off, both agreed that the tissue was morphologically most consistent with myocardial tissue of cardiac muscle. Second, changes suggestive of suffering were noticed, noted in the sample. There was segmentation and fragmentation noted, which is a phenomenon that results when the heart muscle repeatedly spasms before death and it starts to kind of fray. And just to be clear, this is not a degenerative change. It's a change that only happens in living tissue that is stressed to the point of individual cell death. They also commented on the presence of something called contraction band necrosis, which is only seen in the setting of stress-induced cardiomyopathy or reperfusion in injuries that occur after a heart attack. Another interesting thing that they mentioned was that the myocardial fibers from the clot were intimately associated with the residual bread substance of the host. The two substances were intertwined in such a way that it was microscopically impressive. And it was determined that there was no way that human instrumentation could have created this degree of intimacy between the materials. So this helped rule out the idea that this was a man-made artifact, that the things were so um, entwined. Finally, like previous miracles, the expected degenerative changes were not appreciated, even though they were poorly preserved and handled. Remember, the host was kept in water initially, and then it was scooped out and placed on a corporal, and it sat there for months before they actually took some pieces of it to investigate. But once again, there was no sign of a decay or degradation despite that poor preservation. So we're gonna look at this image real quick. The black and white image up on the right corner is the image from the actual relic or the actual miracle. The colored pink image is one that I pulled from the internet. It's just a regular image from cardiac muscle. And you can see how much they look alike. First of all, I think, I don't know how well you can appreciate the striations, but you can see that there's little stripes. If you look down on the like schematic image at the bottom, that shows what those, those unique branching, the striations, and then the thick intercalated discs where each cell connects. You can see those in these pictures. Should I point it out to you? I'm sorry that I can't. But there are, there are thickened bands in between the connecting cells. You can see striations. You can see the nucleus. Basically, those pictures look pretty much identical. 
So I think looking at it, it's very hard to explain why that Im how that image could have been taken from material that originated in a, in a host. I actually think the EM picture is a better quality um, image of muscle than the one that I pulled from the internet. So I really don't have any issues with this. Um, I think they did a great job with their experimentation. But the fun thing about this miracle is the aftermath. Just to reiterate, the investigating pathologists were very well known in their field. They were well respected. They had numerous publications. I believe they both had over 30 years of experience. But we're going to discuss three things that happened after they submitted their results. Once the results leaked out to the rest of the medical community. But first, we're going to start with a positive. Once the relic was placed in the monstrance and set out on display, it attracted many pilgrims. The large groups of people started coming to venerate the relic. And with that, you started hearing these stories of both physical and spiritual healing. Some specific ones that they mentioned were healings from cancer and cardiac arrhythmias. So some real good was being done there. But on the not so good side of it, the professors faced harsh backlash from colleagues and the community. So Poland, historically, it used to have this rich Catholic history. But at this point, it had become very secularized, and Catholicism had actually become a threat to the progressive movement in that region. It was, at this point, looked down upon as being something that was superstitious and silly. So despite their reputation and their experience, Professor Sobaniak, Zatowska, and Solkowski were reprimanded publicly by the director of their hospital and accused of performing illegal and disloyal investigations. They were also accused of being emotionally blinded by the Catholic faith to the point of losing objectivity and rationality in their lab work. So their reputations were pretty much destroyed after this. Next, in October of 2009, a Polish tabloid, the Sun Express, published a story by a professor who claimed that the investigating professors didn't know what they were talking about, as they were likely wrong, and what, they, what was actually happening to this host was an overgrowth of a bacteria called Serratia marcescens. So Serratia, when it grows and colonizes, it creates this fuzzy red look to it. And his point was that, oh, well, you know, that's what it was. It was obviously just this red bacteria that, that they just completely missed. And the funny thing about this is that he just threw this idea out there. He didn't look at the tissue. He never got to investigate it with a microscope. It had nothing to do with it. But once he put it out there, the professional um, journals took it and ran with it, even though it was published in a tabloid. So scientifically, this is completely absurd. We just looked at the electron microscope image of what the tissue looked like, and I can tell you that it looks nothing like bacteria. And here are these poor pathologists who, this is what they do every day, they identify tissue. There's no way that they would have mistaken something like cardiac tissue for a microbe. So lastly, and this is, the, this is my favorite, some random person initiated a public lawsuit addressed to the district attorney claiming that because of this whole situation, a grave crime must have been committed. The reasoning before, for that was that if fresh suffering cardiac tissue had been discovered, there were only four things, there were four things that he had a problem with. The first one is that it was probably taken from a corpse, which defilement of a corpse in Poland at that time was a crime. His Second hypothesis is that it was taken from a murder victim. I mean, you have fresh cardiac tissue. Where exactly do you get that? Especially if you can prove that it's human. Surely a murder happened here, and it was probably by a, you know, crazy Catholic. Third, regardless of where the tissue came from or what it was, it was a biological hazard, and it should never have been placed in the tabernacle with host tissue because that's food stuff. So that was a serious health risk and somebody needed to be punished. And finally, if this whole thing was a hoax, then the authorities should be punished for not doing a better job investigating. So he had this real beef with this whole miracle in Sokolka. And it's just interesting to see how far people will go to oppose the possibility of a miracle. And it makes you wonder why these miracles are such a, a threat, especially if you're 
spreading that all this stuff is silly and superficial, why does it threaten me? So I thought that was interesting. If we get in front of the sun, we get suntans. But when we get in front of Jesus in the Eucharist, we become saints. Blessed Carlo would also say, the more we receive the Eucharist, the more we become like Jesus, so that on earth, we will have a foretaste of heaven. Once again, he's pointing out that the Eucharist is truly supernatural. It gets us closer to our infinite goal and helps us become what we're supposed to be, and that is partakers in the Trinitarian love. We're supposed to be saints. So now we're going to head to the opposite side of Poland, close to the Czech Republic, to the city of Legnitsia. On December 25th, 2013, a priest who was distributing communion accidentally dropped a host from the ciborium that had just been dipped into the consecrated wine. This is a practice called the intinction. He dropped this onto a carpet in the, the carpet in the sanctuary. The priest picked it up and placed it in the container of water and put it in the tabernacle. 16 day li days later, on January 5th, another priest checked the sacred vessel and noticed that a crescent-shaped portion of the host, about half a centimeter by a centimeter and a half in size, had detached from the rest of the unleavened bread and was turning red. Two weeks later, the host had completely dissolved, but the red portion still remained. That's when the bishop requested a scientific investigation. So in this picture, you can see from your right moving this way, the initial host, it started turning red, and then a portion broke off, and then ultimately the rest of the host dissolved and you were only left with a red blood clot. So on January 26, 2014, microsamples were obtained and sent for analysis. And then on February 10th, after the samples were taken, the remaining dark material was transferred to a corporal. So this is a quote from the official report. It says, histopathologic images showed tissue fragments containing fragmented portions of striated muscle. The image to which the examined tissue was overall most similar to was that of cardiac muscle, displaying changes that often accompany a state of agony. So initially, 15 specimens were taken from the host fragment, and specifically to avoid the controversy like that sparked in Sokolka, the sampling took place in the presence of several witnesses and was well photographed with step-by-step -step documentation. Control samples were also taken in this instance. What they found was that the material was too degraded due to immersion in water for an extended period of time. So they, they didn't get many results on this one initially. But they did say that the tissue was not made of bacteria. So there was no serratia in this one. And they also commented that there was no significant fungal contamination. And then they were not able to isolate DNA. But they weren't satisfied with these findings. So what they did was they sent the specimen to a, a separate university that had a, a little more, more resources. This university was able to look at the same tissue microscopically using an ultraviolet light and an orange filter and when they did that, they could confirm the presence of cardiac muscle with clear signs of fragmentation. Again, changes consistent of some sort of stress. I feel like this is one of the best pictures that they have. That looks like cardiac muscle to me. You can see the striations. You can see where it kind of fragments in half. That's where it breaks apart from an intercalated disc. It's not a real good um, example of branching, but to me, it looks like muscle specifically cardiac muscle. On this one, they also attempted to do immunohistochemical analysis where they use antibodies against those protein-specific antigens, I'm sorry, those muscle-specific antigens, but once again, they yielded negative results. So the antibody test did not confirm the presence of muscle, the presence of muscle. They were also able to isolate, in this in, in instance, fragments of both nuclear and mitochondrial DNA that were sufficient to prove the human origin of the tissue beyond a shadow of a doubt. Jesus, have a seat and make yourself at home. After receiving communion, Blessed Carlo would often pray this prayer. Very simple, Jesus, have a seat, make yourself at home. 
What a simple and wonderful prayer to welcome Jesus into your heart and into your life after communion. Okay, so now that we've made it through all of the five miracles, we're going to look at DNA briefly. I told you we'd come back to it. So if you remember, the miracles could identify that DNA was present in most cases, and it confirmed that the DNA was human, but they were never able to profile the DNA or even tell if it was male or female. In most cases, it was difficult due to the age and poor preservation of the specimen. But in some cases, they did get a decent amount of DNA, so why couldn't they profile it? Let's look at what they were trying to do and why they were having difficulty. So when we talk about profiling DNA in a forensic identification sense, we're not talking about sequencing the entire DNA strand. Instead, we're looking at certain points on the strand and trying to see how they compare with other people's DNA. What we're looking at are known as short tandem repeats. So this is gonna be a very brief biology review, so if you have to go to the bathroom or check your phone, this is probably a good time to do it. So in between our important genes, the genes that tell us what hair color we have, what eye color we have, all of those important genes, we have these long sequence repeats. It's kind of like a pause button or a space bar. Now we all have the same short tandem repeats. For instance, we, it's the, the same repeating sequence in each human. The only thing that varies between human to human is the length of that repeating sequence. So if you look at this um, diagram, you have participant one who has a GATA repeat over and over again. His length is eight repeats. He has eight repeats of the same sequence. But if you look at participant four, he has 10 repeats. So we all have the same exact repeats. It's just different lengths that make us different. And we have these on all of our genes. So if you look at this kind of chart to the side, you can see it says the repeat sequence is AGAT. That's on chromosome number five. The number of repeats is usually five to 16 repeats. It varies from individual to individual. So looking at one repeat, it might not tell a bunch of difference between individual to individual. But if you look at 10 to 15 repeats, you start to get kind of a fingerprint of each individual. So what I mean is, if you probe 13 to 20 repeats, or let's say you, you, if you probe 13 repeats, the likelihood of someone else having the same length as all 13 repeats as you do is one in 70 billion. So that's what we use when we're trying to identify you know, um, suspects to murder victims and things like that. You're looking at those repeats and seeing if they line up. That can rule you in or out as a suspect. So what they were doing in this situation is they were trying to target those repeats to see if they could get a good idea of that profile, to see if they could match it to somebody who had been around or, or had, had contact with a relic. So most of the time when they do this, they're trying to rule out contamination or fraud. What else, what does that tell us and why, why do we even care about this? Well, first, again, to rule out fraud, to rule out contamination, but does it really tell us if it's Jesus's DNA? Well, no, if we don't have a copy of Jesus's DNA to compare it to, we're not really gonna know if it's really Jesus's or not. But let's look at the Eucharistic miracles and see what, what they were able to find and, and how this um, is important. First off, we know that Lenciano and Sokolka did not isolate any DNA. So we're gonna focus on the other three. We have Buenos Aires, and in this case, they were able to isolate good quality high molecular weight DNA, but unfortunately, when they went to probe for those 13 short tandem repeats, none of them can be identified. And then in Tixla, the presence of genomic material was detected, but once again, those repeats couldn't be amplified. Now, Legnesia, they were actually able to amplify two of the sought after short tandem repeats. Now, it was only two of the 10 to 20 that they were, actually, they were probing for, but it was enough to confirm beyond a shadow of a doubt that it was human DNA. So why do I bring this up? Why do I bring this up if most of it, it's negative? What does it mean? Ultimately, they couldn't get a good pro profile. And this could be due, again, to the age of the specimen, but remember, none of them were optimally preserved, so maybe it was just a coincidence. They've been out it too long and we just couldn't probe them. But Dr. Constanian, 
who investigated again both the Buenos Aires and the Tixla miracles, makes a really good point about this. He claims that the inability to obtain the DNA profile from all of the miraculous tissue is actually a bit of a confirmation of the authenticity of the supernatural origin. With the amount of DNA that we were able to isolate, we should have been able to amplify at least some of the tandem repeat sequence. Remember, all humans have the same repeat sequences, so why couldn't we identify them in this blood? Interestingly, in Castanian's experience, Cases where DNA amplification was actually successful usually proved to be involuntary contamination from someone else who touched the relic. Most of the things that were truly thought to be miraculous were never able to be profiled. Now, I haven't read any of these. And I assume that they are real books. Um, and hopefully they're all fiction. But you can see where this is going. If these relics truly contained the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ, why would Jesus ever give us his DNA? He wouldn't give us the building blocks to head down this road, because you know that the first thing that we would try to do with it was clone it. So I think there really is something to be said about the idea that the inability to probe these short tender repeats and to get a good genetic profile may actually be a pertinent positive finding instead of a negative. I can't imagine him Giving, this, giving us that ability when he knows that it's not something that we ever, ever should do. Now briefly, I'm gonna share something that I thought was pretty cool about ABO blood types before we wrap it up. As you recall, the relics were all typed. I'm sorry, the relics that were typed, which were Lanciano and Tixla, were consistent with the AB blood group. Interesting, if you look at other relics, like the Passion Cloths, which include the Shroud of Turin, the Sedarium of Ovideo, which is another um, cloth that was wrapped around Jesus' head during his burial, and the Holy Tunic of um, Argentil, which is the tunic that the soldiers were fighting over, they were casting lots for when Jesus was on the cross. You'll see that all of these relics type as AB. Now I'm gonna spare you getting into the weeds on this, but you may remember from science class that the type O blood type is the universal donor and type AB is the universal recipient. As I've read through material like this over the years, I've always been led to believe that Jesus has to be type O. Why? Because O is considered the universal donor. If you need to give someone blood, you can always give O, regardless of the recipient's blood type. Anybody can receive O and they won't have a reaction to it. So it sounds kind of poetic or romantic that Jesus should be the universal donor, right? After all, he gave his blood for us. Well, Dr. Serafini makes an amazing point that Jesus is in fact AB. And here's what he bases it on. First off, AB is the rarest of all blood groups. This makes contamination with outside blood a little tricky. What are the odds of a random churchgoer bleeding on a host and being AB blood, especially with three different locations around the globe? So remember, all of these different locations are AB. What are the chances of somebody with the rarest blood group contaminating each and every one of these? Secondly, the AB blood type has been around for over 2,000 years and was present in Palestine back during the time of Jesus. So we know there are relics from that time that date as AB. Third, if you take five samples like Lanciano, Tixla, the Shroud, the Sedarium, and the Tunic, all from different parts of the world, collected at different times, the likelihood of those samples all being typed as AB is 1 in 3,200,000. And most of these were sampled without knowing the results of the blood type for the other relics. So a forger would have had to have known what the other ones were gonna type as to be able to make it consistent. And that's very, very unlikely. Also, he argues that it would be more appropriate for Jesus to be the universal recipient. Patients with an AB blood type don't make antibodies because they recognize both A and B antigens as self antigens. Therefore, they can get any type of blood out there because they don't have antibodies that'll attack it. So they're the universal recipient. They can, they can, you can give them any type of blood. C. 
Serafini states that it could be said that only the universal receiver, the AB blood group, could act as a universal solvent in which any kind of blood of any and every human being could be mixed to be purified. The AB blood welcomes our own blood without reacting against it. That way our blood dissolves or hides in his and only then can it be elevated to his infinite preciousness. So his blood washes ours. And I really liked that idea. So what does this all mean? Well, first off, I think the Eucharist is definitely supernatural. We have discussed some events that cannot be explained naturally. This could lead us to understand that there is something special about the Eucharist, and I urge you to use this as an invitation to learn more about it, to find out why God gave, it, gave us such this amazing gift, and what role this sacrament plays in our salvation. Like Blessed Carlo Acutis said, the more you get around it, the holier and closer to God you will become. The second thing is to notice that God reveals himself in hidden ways to give us the opportunity to meet him halfway with faith. Some of my ancestors have said in the past that God is a gentleman. He's not going to force himself in. You have to say yes, and you have to invite him. He's not going to reveal himself so fully to the point where you can't say no. Instead, he wants to give us each the opportunity to choose to cooperate with him out of our own free will. Finally, I think this is a great argument against the agnostic beliefs that have been percolating around the world today. This is the belief that there may or may not be a God out there, but there's no way of knowing because he's out there and he's totally off limits. He's hands off, like the clockmaker who creates the clock and then just sticks it on the shelf to kind of run its course. Well, if God is dropping these hints, these little breadcrumbs leading us to the truth, it would appear that he's very much present and active in this world. He's like an amazing father who gives us a chance to go at life on our own but throws in little hints to nudge us in the right direction and closer to him. Again, he's always a gentleman, but he's definitely there working in the world to help us find our way back to heaven and back to the infinite. So let's close with a word of prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for your amazing gift of the Eucharist of your son's body and blood poured out for our salvation. We thank you for your faithful followers, including the blessed Carlo Acutis, Dr. Franco Serafini, Dr. Zagib, and all the other medical professionals who are brave enough to let the world know the truth about your Eucharistic miracle. We also thank you for continually drawing all of us, your people, to yourself. Lord, help us to grow closer to the Eucharist, closer to you, and closer to our heavenly home this Advent season as we prepare our hearts for the coming of your Son on Christmas morning, as well as, as his second coming in glory. We are forever in your debt and will remain forever grateful. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you all for coming tonight. I hope you all have a wonderful holiday. What a fantastic uh, presentation. I mean, it really elevated um, not only our intellect, but our hearts, because truly when we receive him um, in the Eucharist, we have now an even more appreciation for him. I think, uh, Dr. Goody, it's, I think it's interesting that um, he's giving us his heart. And uh, as we know, in 1647, uh, Jesus appeared to St. Margaret Mary Alacoque in France and gave the sacred heart devotion. And, but one thing that he said to, uh, to spread this message was, he said, behold the heart which has so loved men that he has spared nothing, even exhausting and consuming itself in testimony of its love. It makes us ponder then this gift that we receive. As, um, as spiritual writers would say, 
when we separate the gift from the giver is when we begin to have, take things for granted. I think this presentation, Dr. Goodyear, is a wonderful uh, testimony of this gift comes from the giver, who is Jesus himself, not separated, but intimately united to Jesus. So we thank you again, and um, as this, our diocese celebrates and uh, uh, Eucharistic revival, I think, Dr. Goodyear, this was a wonderful way of kicking off, uh, a way of uh, appreciating the Eucharist again. So, and thank you for coming out tonight.